Okay. So thank you to the organizers for this opportunity to come to the beautiful city here. I'm going to talk about neutron scattering. Neutron scattering is an experimental technique, so this is basically an experimental talk. Um, the first lecture today is about the theory of neutron scattering, and then the second one will be more about how to use neutron scattering to measure um, quantum magnets. So, here's the outline. Um, I start with a discussion of magnetism. It's a basic discussion about conventional magnets, long-range magnetic order, spin wave excitations. Um, so that's the first part, and these are what we want to investigate, and you can investigate them, investigate them using the experimental technique of neutron scattering. And so I'll go into depth into that technique the properties of the neutron, neutron sources, um, the technique of neutron scattering, that's neutron scattering triangles, neutron scattering cross-sections, what they measure, and how they can be related to a theoretical calculation. So that's the, the concepts, and then actually doing it, so having a neutron scattering instrument where you have a sample, a material, which is magnetic, and then you measure it in the neutron beam, and you measure your scattered neutrons, and you learn something about the sample. So using actual instruments. That's the third part. And then I'll talk about spin waves, how to calculate them, and how to measure them. And that's the introduction to neutron scattering. And then the second talk tomorrow will be about quantum magnets and measuring quantum magnets using neutron scattering. OK. So the first part was conventional magnets. So conventional magnets, we have, um, I'm talking mostly about insulators. We have um, magnetic ions. So we have, we have um, magnetic ions which have a nucleus, and then they have electrons around the nucleus, and you're talking about electronic spin and electronic angular momentum, which means, so they have, uh, the electrons have spin and angular momentum, which means that they have a magnetic moment. This magnetic moment is, of course, quantized. Um, so, for example, if you had a manganese 2 plus ion, uh, you would have um, a spin of five halves f from the collective, uh, due to your unpaired electrons going around your uh, nucleus. And of course, that then has six possible states with respect to a given axis. So we can take magnetic ions like this, ions which have an, a net magnetic moment, and we can put them in a lattice, in a magnetic material, and they interact with each other. For example, they could interact via the Heisenberg interaction, which uh, couples pairs of spins. So here's a lattice. It's a two-dimensional lattice. Uh, so that's the blue dots, they're the magnetic ions, and then the red lines represent interactions between these magnetic ions, and different there are different types of interactions which are given different labels, J1, J2, J3, these are different strengths of interactions, maybe, maybe they're ferromagnetic or some are antiferromagnetic. So, for example, if you had um, an orthorhombic crystal structure, you would have magnetic ions where you had a different A and B direction, and so you could have this type of lattice. And of course, these layers would be stacked on top of each other, so you could have a three-dimensional magnet. So for example, in rubidium manganese trifluoride, where the manganese ions form a three-dimensional lattice. Um, or uh, in lanthanum cuprate, here, the magnetic ions are coupled actually in two dimensions. Of course, the material itself is a three-dimensional material, but the copper ions, which are the magnetic ones, are coupled only into a square lattice, and so it's an effectively two-dimensional magnet. You can also get one-dimensional magnets. Um, for example, if the coupling occurs along one direction and then between to make chains of ions, as in potassium copper trifluoride, 
So you've got strong coupling between the magnetic current in one direction and then very weak, negligible interactions in other directions. And therefore, we can say it's effectively a one-dimensional magnet. And all these can be realized in actual materials, which you can make and then study. OK. You can also have anisotropic interactions. So if you have a, a magnet, you've got your magnetic ions in a lattice. They interact with each other. But at high temperatures, of course, they're fluctuating. They don't really see their neighbors because the thermal energy causes strong fluctuations. And only when you cool down do you get magnetic order. They then start to see each other, and they slow down, and then they fix into a particular ordered arrangement. So this is a real space picture, what you might imagine happening in a material. It goes through its phase transition to magnetic order. But in reciprocal space, so where you take the Fourier transform of this crystal, what you might actually see is the appearance of new Bragg peaks. These are the magnetic Bragg peaks occurring below this nail ordering temperature. And the appearance of these Bragg peaks, or the strength of them, so here is a reciprocal lattice. You've got nuclear Bragg peaks, which give out the structure, and then you've got new magnetic Bragg peaks that be appear below a nail temperature. The size of the Bragg peak is actually an order parameter for this transition. OK. And then, now we're back. We're in our ordered ground state. Our spins are fixed in a particular direction. It's a, let's say it's a ferromagnet. They're all pointing in the same direction. Um, that's the ground state, but we can have excitations. So if you give the, the system a little bit of energy, the spins can start to oscillate a little bit about their ordering direction. So they start rotating a little bit. That's, that's a spin wave type excitation. Here's a, a snapshot of the spin wave oscillations in an antiferromagnet. Um, so they're oscillating about their average ordering direction. These are real space pictures. If you now take the Fourier transform of that, which is basically what neutrons do, you would observe um, a dispersion in wave vector and energy space, and you would see a dispersive mode, um, which looks like this for a ferromagnet, or like this for an antiferromagnet. So this is an introduction. Probably you know all this already. But these are the sort of things one can measure with neutron scattering. So now I'm going to move on to the concepts behind neutron scattering as an experimental technique to study magnets like this. So neutron scattering, what you do is you get neutrons. They have an energy. You fire them at your sample, the material that you've decided you want to study. And then you collect the scattered pattern. And from that scattered pattern, you can deduce things about your material. And so what is the neutron? Well, what is its properties? It's a nuclear particle, of course. Um, it has a mass similar to the proton. Importantly, it's neutral. It has no charge. Now, it has a spin. And this is what allows it to see magnetism within materials and to study it. Because it has a spin, it has a magnetic moment due to the nuclear magneton. And interestingly, it has a, the free neutron has a finite lifetime of about 15 minutes. So of course, because it's a quantum mechanical particle, it behaves both like a wave and a particle at the same time. So in an experiment, you create neutron particles. Um, but then you scatter them, and then they behave like waves. But when, when after scattering, a scattering event, you collect them, and you measure them, and you count the number, and you're then thinking of them, about them in terms of particles again. 
So the neutron, of course, it has a mass and therefore it has a momentum, which is its mass times its velocity. Um, but it, of course, it also um, has a momentum which is h cross Planck's constant times wave vector because it's a quantum mechanical particle. And you can therefore put these two quantities together, momentum equals mass times velocity times equals h cross wave vector, and you can write velocity in terms of wave vector. Now the wave vector, of course, can be, is, can be related to the de Broglie wavelength. It's just two pi over the wavelength. So once you've got the wave vector, you've got the wavelength. You can write the wavelength in terms of the wave vector or the wavelength in terms of the velocity by substituting these. Now the energy of the neutron is it's actually, it's actually just its kinetic energy because it's moving, it has a speed. So it's half mv squared, half m velocity squared, which of course you can, you can substitute velocity for the wave vector. The point I'm trying to make here is that you've got quantities, energy, velocity, wave vector, and wavelength, and they're all related to each other. So once you know one of them, you know all of them. Okay, so now the question is, how does the neutron interact with matter? So I've emphasized that the neutron can measure magnetic properties. But it all, all, actually, its main and its first, um, it, the first interest in neutron scattering was its ability to see nuclei. And this is because it's a nuclear particle. As a nuclear particle, it sees nuclei inside a solid state material. So it scatters via the strong nuclear force. And of course, as I said before, it's sensitive to magnetism. This is because it has it has a magnetic moment itself, and therefore it sees um, magnetic fields inside the sample. These magnetic fields are generated by the unpaired electrons due to their spin or their orbital motion. So here we have the neutron. Here, so here's a material. <laughs> We've got a nucleus with an electron, unpaired electron going around. So the neutron comes along and it can interact with the nucleus and be scattered by it. Um, it can also interact with the unpaired electron magnetically and be scattered via magnetic scattering. Okay, so where do neutrons come from? Sources of neutrons, so one source of neutrons and the original source is actually the fission process where an atom is split and in some cases the byproduct of that splitting is um, other atoms or other nuclei and neutrons. Okay, the famous one is to have uranium, the isotope 235 of uranium. Now if a spare neutron arrives, it sends it into it gets absorbed and becomes uranium-236. But it doesn't live long. Soon it splits into barium and krypton, releasing three neutrons and lots of energy. And that, of course, is the source of nuclear power. But you notice we've got three neutrons now, and they have a lot of energy. So these neutrons go on to other uranium uh, nuclei, and get absorbed, go to uranium-236, cause it to split and release more neutrons and more energy. So this is known as the chain reaction. It's what happens inside a nuclear reactor. Now, in neutron scattering, you can use... So you have, of course, reactors for power, but you can also have research reactors where you use these neutrons for neutron scattering experiments. So the second way to make neutrons is the spallation process. So here we have, um, we have very high energy protons. So protons are accelerated to very high speeds, to a fraction of the speed of light. Um, and then they are fired at some heavy metal target. 
for example, mercury or tantalum, something like this. And because they have so much energy, they, um, they enter the nuclei and, tend to, and send it into an excited state. And then as it releases its energy, it also releases neutrons and protons. Um, so this, this is known as the spallation process. So for every proton that arrives, you can get something like 15 to 20 neutrons coming out of this. So this is an, used basics based on a particle accelerator. It's known as a spallation source. So advantages of neutron scattering. Um, so as well as being able to see magnetic, magnetic moments in a cider material, they're also suitable because um, the energy and wavelengths of the neutron are well matched to condensed matter materials. So uh, you can make neutrons with different energies. You can call cold, thermal, and hot. So these are the temperatures and associated energies. And for those energies of neutrons, so when you know the energy, you know the wavelength. You also know the wave vector and velocity. So we also know the wavelength. So, di so if you go to the thermal range here, Neutrons with an energy of 5 to 100 milli electron volts have wavelengths of 1 to 4 angstrom. So 1 to 10 angstrom is pretty typical for distances in unit cell sizes of materials. At the same time, these sort of energies are typical of magnetic excitations. So what this means is we can simultaneously measure um, the um, magnetic properties as a function of wavelength and energy and, and wave vector and energy. So we can follow, for example, a phonon dispersion or a spin wave dispersion throughout a Brillouin zone. So another advantage of neutrons is actually their weak, weakly scattering. So this is different from electrons and X-rays. So when the neutrons arrive at a sample, only a small fraction are actually scattered by the sample. These are the useful ones. These are the ones you're going to measure and use. But it's only a small fraction, and the remaining neutrons pass through. So it means that you don't have multiple scattering events. It means that you don't have beam decay inside your sample. And why that's good? is because it means that your, the equations are simple to calculate. It means that you can easily relate what you've measured with neutron scattering to a theory. Of course, it's also a disadvantage in terms of getting enough signal, but there we go. So, you start the experiment, you have, let's say we have a, a sample, a material that we want to investigate. And then we've got neutrons, and they're coming in in this direction. They've all been collimated, so they're coming in in a straight way, all in the same direction. These are the incident neutrons. Um, and they arrive at the sample, and then three things can happen. So some of them will pass all the way through. Actually, most of them will. They're the transmitted neutrons. Some of them will be absorbed, so they just come to a stop. And some will be scattered. Uh, so you can then get your detector, and you can put your detector here to measure the transmitted neutrons. And this is basically um, a process known as neutron real space imaging. Uh, right. So I won't talk about that. The other place you can put your detector is around here, actually at any angle other than transmitted. That collects the scattered neutrons. Um, so you measure the scattered pattern, which tells you about interference, interference between the different scattering centers inside the sample, which is basically 
um, diffraction from your sample. Right. So now we're going to look at the scattered neutron beam. So here we have, we have the instant neutron beam and we have the sample and after the sample, after passing through the sample, some of the neutrons are scattered. They're scattered at this angle 2 theta. The instant neutrons have wave vector Ki energy Ei. The final neutrons have wave vector Kf and energy Ef, final energy, final wave vector. Right, so this angle is known as the, the scattering angle. So now you can imagine what, what happened. So the wave, sometimes in the scattering process, the energy before and after scattering is unchanged. So it's just a change in direction of the neutrons. This is a kind of diffraction process. The other thing that can happen is actually the neutron can lose energy in the scattering process. Um, so it has less energy after scattering. Because by conservation of energy, you must have given some energy. It must have given some of that energy to the sample. So in this way, you can create an excitation. So the, the two processes are elastic. The neutron doesn't change its energy in the scattering process. The initial and final energy are the same. It, the second process is inelastic. The neutron loses or gains energy in the scattering process. And in doing so, it creates or destroys an excitation. So now this can be expressed in scattering triangles, but first we must remember we have conservation of energy. So if the energy of the neutron changes in the scattering process, its kinetic energy is different before and after. This can also be written, the difference can also be written in terms of the wave vectors. That change in energy must be h cross omega, the energy given to the sample. There's also conservation of momentum, so h cross q. So the difference in the initial and final wave vectors of the neutron equal the um, wave vector change inside the sample, which is given by q, the scattering wave vector. So the first scattering event is going to be elastic so we're going to think about a scattering event from the sample. We have instant neutrons, Ki. They arrive at the sample, that's the green dot, and they're scattered. That means they change their direction by an angle 2 theta. So then they're represented after the scattering event by this arrow, Kf. And the length of Ki and the length of Kf are the same because the neutron didn't didn't uh, lose any energy, therefore the modulus of the wave vectors must be the same if the energies are to be the same. So that's how to represent the scattering event, but these are just vectors and we can rearrange the vectors like that. And then we can say, well, the difference between, the vector difference between Ki and Kf is Q, the scattering vector, which is the wave vector transfer to the sample. It's about where the scattering event happened inside the, the sample. Um, you can write Q in terms of Ki and Kf using triangular geometry so that you can write sine theta equals Q by 2. OK. Now, going back to the original scattering diagram, where this is Q, this is the scattering event, if Q lies along a reciprocal space direction inside the material, then we should see a Bragg peak. Therefore, um, if Q is a reciprocal lattice vector, that reciprocal lattice vector uh, 
the size of the wave vector transfer and the size of the reciprocal lattice vector must be made equal if you see a Bragg peak in your detector, and then you get simply Bragg's law. Right, okay. So that was basically neutron diffraction. You can also do inelastic neutron scattering and describe it in, in terms of uh, scattering triangles. So here's another scattering event where this time the neutron loses energy and an excitation is created. So if the neutron loses energy, the length of the wave vector after the scattering event must be smaller than before the scattering event, as shown here. So the neutron loses en energy and creates an excitation at the sample at wave vector Q. The other case is where the neutron gains energy, so the final wave vector of the neutron is actually larger because it destroyed an excitation within the sample and it destroyed it at the wave vector Q. So that's a kind of pictorial way to understand neutron scattering, but of course, to do it properly, you have to go through the maths. I don't do it here, but this is what you need to calculate is something called the cross-section, and it's, it's shown here. It basically involves a matrix element um, between the initial and final states of the neutron and the sample. And the matrix element, the, the potential inside the matrix element, is the interaction between the neutron and the sample. And I told you there were two ways in which the neutron interacts with the sample. It interacts via the strong nuclear force, in which case this interaction here is very uh, short range and is approximated by a delta function. So it's interacting with the nuclei. It's seeing the nuclei within the sample. The second way it interacts is via the magnetic moments inside the sample. Um, in which case, it's the interaction of the uh, magnetic moment of the neutron with the magnetic field due to the spin and orbital angular momentum of the electrons, of the unpaired electrons inside the material, which takes this much more complicated form. But it is actually just mu dot b, in fact. But to write it out properly, you have to involve the individual spin and orbital mo angular momentum of the electrons. OK, so here's the cross-section when you have put that magnetic potential. So you put the magnetic potential inside the cross-section and then do a lot of work on it, and it ends up looking like this. So I just point out a few things. I think the most important thing occurs here, which is the spin-spin correlation function. So what the neutron actually measures is it measures the spin-spin correlation. It takes the Fourier transform in um, time and in space of the spin-spin correlation function. Spin-spin correlation function is the function that says if the spin in the material at this place R is doing something, um, what is the probability that the spin at a distance R dash away is doing something else at a time later, at a certain time later? That's what the correlation function is. And what neutron scattering basically does is it takes the Fourier transform of that spin-spin correlation function. And the important thing about this is this is something that the spin-spin correlation function and its Fourier transform are things that can be calculated theoretically. So neutron scattering can give a quantitative measurement of uh, this quantity. OK. So now I want to talk about actually doing a measurement, so using 
neutron scattering instruments, starting with diffraction. Um, so diffraction is a way to um, it's um, a way to look at magnetic and nuclear structures. So when you're doing diffraction, you're not interested in creating excitation to the material. You're just interested in a scattering event that doesn't transfer any energy. So we're looking at the ground state in a way. So um, the important thing then is to measure the scattering angle to theta. And it's also important to know what your wavelength is. So typically, this is an instrument. You start the instrument, so you have, you have the neutrons coming here towards a monochromator. Neutrons typically are made with a range of wavelengths, either inside the reactor or the spallation source, and you can use a monochromator to select one wavelength. Um, so I'll talk a bit more about the monochromator. So after passing through the monochromator, the neutrons have one wavelength. Then, you, uh, then they go towards a sample. So here you would have a sample, and it's held on this frame, which allows you to rotate the sample in different directions. So the neutrons arrive at the sample after passing through the monochromator, so they have a special wavelength or a chosen wavelength and a chosen wave vector. They arrive at the sample, and then the sample scatters them by um, an angle to theta. And then the detector will measure the number of neutrons that arrived at that scattering angle. So here we have, and then the, so of course, what we're interested in, what goes on inside the sample, so the wave vector transfer to the sample is Q, that's the difference between KF and KI. So now we have a scattering triangle. And um, now if you just put your sample down on your instrument in any particular, just without, just without any orientation, you're very unlikely to see something in the detector. You're only going to see something in the detector when an interesting direction or reciprocal space direction of the sample is actually aligned along the wave vector Q. So most of the time, you, you won't see anything. So you have to then rotate your sample until you align a reciprocal lattice direction along the wave vector Q. So you've got a reciprocal space of the sample, and it needs to be rotated. And only at that point do you see something in the detector. So then typically what you do is you, um, you select your two theta for a known Bragg peak, and then you rotate your sample to, so that you see signal in the detector. Then you measure the size of that signal by measuring the number of neutrons that arrive in the detector. And then you measure a different peak and a different one, and you collect lots of information like this. Now, just going back to the monochromator, so how does the monochromator work? So the monochromator was a way to select a single wavelength out of the broad spectrum of wavelengths produced by the spallation source or the reactor. And actually, the monochromator itself is just a crystal. In this, it's chosen to be a crystal that scatters uh, very strongly. Um, so it's a crystal that's going to be used to select out one wavelength out of the neutron beam. So here we have, for example, a monochromator. These are the uh, layers of the monochromator with D spacing D. And we have an incident white neutron beam arriving at the monochromator at an angle theta. Um, and according to Bragg's law, only, only only the uh, wavelength that obeys Bragg's law for this value of 2 theta and this despacing are going to be reflected back. And those are those we can choose to use those neutrons with the chosen wavelength for our experiment, and the remaining neutrons will pass through the, sum, uh, through the monochromator. So and, um, when you actually do an experiment, 
actually you often, instead of using a single crystal and rotating it to get your orientation correct so you can see something in your detector, instead of that, what you actually normally do is use a powder sample. So a powder sample is like a million little crystals, each with a different orientation. So a powder consists of many little grains, each typically a micron in size. And um, if you then have all these different orientations of, of the powders, there's going to always be some crystal that's going to, some little crystal inside a powder that's going to satisfy Bragg's law. So when you have neutrons coming in towards your sample, you will get um, what are called these Debye Shearer rings of scattering, where the neutrons are scattered off for example, from the 220 Bragg peak in a ring of constant 2 theta angle. And you get a ring for each Bragg peak. The importance here is you don't need to do any alignments. You can just then scan through these rings by changing the 2 theta angle, and you see a series of peaks. And from those peaks, then you can measure their intensity and then fit them to determine the crystal structure. So here's a typical neutron powder diffractometer. Um, we have a neutron source. It goes through um, various slits, etc., until we get to the monochromator. So this is a white beam of neutrons. The monochromator is angled so that it selects a particular wavelength of neutrons. So this chosen wavelength then is, goes off in this direction and the remaining neutrons pass on through or get absorbed. These neutrons with the single wavelength now go through some slits until they arrive here at the sample. The sample then scatters the neutrons. It's a powder sample, so it produces these Debye Shearer rings of constant 2 theta angle. And then there's this detector, that's this bank, which forms a semicircle around the sample, and we have its um, the position on this detector. Each, for example, here we have two th a small two theta angle, and here we have a large two theta angle. So it's able to measure a continuous range of two theta or scattering angles, and produce a continuous plot of Bragg peaks. So now an example of an experiment. So here is some data from a material. It's strontium cobalt vanadate. Strontium cobalt vanadate has magnetic order below 5.2 Kelvin. This measurement was performed at 8 Kelvin, so it's above this ordering temperature. So at this temperature, we expect only to see Bragg peaks from the nuclear structure due to the scattering of the neutrons by the strong nuclear force from the nuclei within the sample. So here we have the Bragg peaks. This is a powder pattern. Um, so it's plotted as a function of despacing, or 2 theta. And so the Bragg peaks can be labeled. And from this, it's possible then to know what the crystal structure is. So these positions of the peaks tell you the size of the unit cell. Uh, the A, B, and C lattice parameters, and the sizes of the peaks give the positions of the um, ions within the unit cell. So then we can measure again, now at the temperature of 1.5 Kelvin. 1.5 Kelvin, we're below the nail temperature, so now we have long-range magnetic order. So what happens is then we get additional peaks. These are magnetic Bragg peaks. These are these ones. So it wasn't here at 8 Kelvin, but now it's appeared. These are the shaded in pink. So these extra Bragg peaks, which appeared below the transition temperature, are the magnetic Bragg peaks. From the magnetic Bragg peaks, it's possible to work out the magnetic structure which is where are the spins on the magnetic cobalt ions, where are they pointing? 
And from this, we learn then, for example, that the spins form these kind of zigzag chains along the C-axis. Within this AB plane, they're antiferromagnetically lined in one direction and ferromagnetically aligned in another direction. And also that the direction of the spins is parallel to the C-axis. OK. So that was neutron diffraction. Neutron diffraction tells us about um, structure. It, it tells us about, yes? But before you move on, um, when you have magnetic order, yes. like the order parameter, it grows? So yes. It's the amplitude. It, the position, the position of the Bragg peaks is determined by the type of order. So, if it's an antiferromagnet, for example, it might, it will could involve doubling the unit cell. So, it's the position is the type of order, and the. Um, the order parameter, or the size of the Bragg peaks, is the order parameter, so it's the, the amount of order. So just at the transition, there's only a little bit of order. It's like only 10% of each spin is actually ordered. But then that grows as you cool. OK, so that was diffraction. Now I want to talk about inelastic. Inelastic scattering is where the neutron gives some of its energy to the sample and so you can create an excitation. Um, so, of course, the important thing in this case is to not only know your initial wave vector or your initial energy of your neutron, you now also need to measure the final neutron energy. Then you can see the difference and find out how much energy went to your sample. So this is a, a layout of an instrument here we have the neutrons coming in, and then we have a monochromator. So the monochromator selects the wavelength of the neutrons, which of course means we also know the energy of those neutrons. Okay, then the neutrons come to the sample. Sample is here. Then we choose, so, okay, so that, yeah, let's go back. So then we choose to put our, our analyzer here at a particular angle. So the analyzer, so we don't have a detector, we have the analyzer. First we have the analyzer. The analyzer measures the wavelength or the energy of the scattered neutrons. And then we have a detector which measures the number of the scattered neutrons. So I can put the scattering triangle over it. We have the incident neutrons, and we have the final neutron wave vector. Um, and of course, I'm now thinking of inelastic. So we have the, the final neutrons have a smaller wave vector than the initial neutrons because they lost some energy. And then if I um, look at the wave vectors, to make the scattering triangle, the wave vector Q must go in this direction. This is the actual picture of what it looks like. So here is the monochromator. And now you can't actually see the monochromator is a crystal, but it's all covered in shielding to prevent radiation. Uh, here's the table where the sample would be. Then we have the analyzer housing. So that measures the final neutron energy, and then the detector that measures the number of neutrons. That's the scattering triangle. Um, so now you typically, in a measurement, you do scans. You can do, so I think there's going to be an excitation at a particular energy, so I'm going to scan my energy until I find that excitation. That's a typical way to do a measurement. Or I think at this wave vector, the intensity should be strong, so I'm going to scan along in wave vector until I find it. So typically, you can do a scan. Here we have the reciprocal space of the material with the reciprocal lattice vectors. And on top of it is drawn a scattering triangle. 
And so you can, for example, keep wave vector transfer constants. So we're going to measure at this wave vector transfer in the sample. We want to measure this point. We're going to keep wave vector transfer constant and scan energy. That means that we want to, so here we're measuring one particular energy, which is the difference between the energy of Kf and Ki. Now we're going to measure another energy. So this is actually a greater energy, a greater difference between Kf and Ki. So we're measuring, we're looking for a transition at a higher energy. So we can scan energy by changing the length of Kf and Ki while keeping while keeping at a particular wave vector in the material. And from that, so if you did that scan, you might see something like an ex two excitations in this, in this case as you scan energy. Now you can also scan wave vector, so you can keep your energy fixed. So you keep the difference between Ki and Kf constant but you change the angle between them so you can measure different wave vectors. So we could scan along this wave vector, for example, by changing the angle between Ki and Kf. And then you can scan, uh, for example, for two, two excitations like this. OK, maybe I... OK, maybe I can do this. So. Um, there's another way in which you can measure energy in a, the energy of the neutrons other than using a monochromator and analyzer crystal and that is to use time so the neutrons move at a particular velocity which is related to their wavelength um, and so you can select you can select the energy of the neutrons by using choppers. So here we have the neutron beam, which comes along here to the sample. And in the beam, we have some choppers here and here. And the chopper is basically a disk with a hole in it. And the disk rotates. And once each rotation, the neutrons can pass through. And otherwise, they're blocked. So basically, the chopper cuts the, the first one, cuts the beam into pulses. We have pulses with each at a time t0. And then, so I show it here, and then you can place another chopper, a distance L1, away from the first chopper. And this also rotates at the same, at the same rate, with opens also once per revolution. And now you just need to select the phase so that this one opens, this one opens at a time, a known time, a chosen time after this one opens. So what you're selecting is a time difference between this chopper and this chopper, which basically means that you're selecting a speed of neutrons. So you can select the speed of your neutrons by selecting the phase difference between these choppers. Once you've selected a velocity, then you've also, of course, selected the kinetic energy. And so you can continue like this. You can have chopper one, chopper two. So after chopper two, chopper one cuts the beam into pulses, and chopper two selects one wavelength out of each pulse. That wavelength goes to the neutrons, is then scattered by the neutrons into a detector bank. Now, these detectors measure the number of neutrons arriving, but they also measure the time of arrival. So basically, you can also measure the speed of the neutrons after the scattering event. So you know the speed after, you know the speed before, and so you know the energy difference of the neutrons before and after scattering. And so that's another way to do inelastic scattering and measure the excitations that you've created. So the last part, um, spin waves spin wave excitations and measuring them. So this is an example of or some picture illustration of excitations in condensed matter. Now, not just magnetic excitations, a variety of excitations. Things like phonons, crystal field excitations here, yeah, um, 
rotational modes in molecules. These are all the sort of things that can be measured by neutrons. Neutrons can measure um, both excitations of the structure of the nuclei, of the structure, like phonons, and excitations of the magnetic system, like spin waves. Here, I'm going to concentrate on spin waves. Um, so if we have a simple Hamiltonian way where we have um, interactions between nearest or next nearest neighbors, as shown here, and they can have different values, JA, JB, etc. In this sort of system, where we have long-range magnetic order and a simple set of exchange interactions like this, we would expect to see spin waves, usually. And when you... So you can calculate the spin waves by diagonalizing this Hamiltonian um, to find out uh, what the excitations look like, the spin wave excitations look like. And this can be done using programs, for example, like spin W. So spin waves are the conventional excitations of a magnetic system. They are based on materials that have long-range magnetic order. If you've got long-range magnetic order, you may well have spin wave excitations. Um, and it's interesting to measure spin wave excitations because there's measure the excitations in material because you can compare them to spin wave theory and you can use then fit them to this theory to determine the sizes of these exchange interactions. Right, so here is an example. This is the compound barium nickel vanadate. Barium nickel vanadate is, uh, has a honeycomb structure. It's the nickel, which is magnetic in this case. Nickels form this honeycomb, and then these honeycombs are stacked on top of each other. There's in, there's, so here's one of the honeycomb layers. There's interactions between first neighbors second neighbors and third neighbors. And there's also interactions between the layers. This is a powder measurement. So the excitations of a powder sample as a function of wave vector and energy. OK, so it's known that um, barium nickel vanadate develops long-range magnetic order. It's antiferromagnetic and has what's known as an ordering wave vector of a half. This is its Hamiltonian with first, second, third neighbor interactions, interactions between the layers and then some anisotropies. This is a measurement of the low energies showing Two, two modes, and here's some other measurements in different directions in reciprocal space. And in all cases, you see these sharp excitations typical of spin waves, which come down at Bragg peak positions. So then the trick is to do a calculation using spin wave theory. Here's the calculation. Um, now, to get this calculation, the values of the exchange interactions had to be adjusted. And the solution was, for example, that JN, the first neighbor interaction, is 11 MeV. JNN, the second neighbor interaction, is about 1 MeV. So by measuring these ty this type of spectrum, it's possible to get these type of interactions from a material if it has long-range magnetic order and spin wave excitations. Okay, so I think I end there. We talked about conventional magnets, neutron scattering, neutron scattering instruments, and spin waves. And next time I plan to talk about unconventional magnets and studying them with neutrons. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thanks for the talk. So, I mean, in the beginning, you showed kind of that uh, this uh, 
the process of scattering or like shooting a neutron through a sample is kind of uh, the intensities you get are kind of related to the spin-spin correlation function. Yes. So if I was now more interested in looking at uh, like multi magnon uh, processes, is there also a way to get uh, some like something out of the experiment that is more related to maybe you know the expectation value of four spin operators, let's say that I uh, put in? What I mean is that normally there's only one scattering event because it's uh, because scattering is rare. Ah, okay, it's yeah. normally only one scattering event, but of course, if your Hamiltonian includes, or it's going to produce multi magnons, then that's what you're going to see in your spectrum. The, the point I made is only that it's scattering is a rare event, so normally you only get single scattering events. You don't get multiples. You d your neutron doesn't scatter once and then scatter again. Okay, so like you you would have to look at in the multi magnon stuff by looking how, how much damping you get of the intensities of uh, you, single events. Uh, yes. Except, okay. you, you can only look at, you usually only look at single events. Okay, thanks. I have actually a question. Um, at the beginning you mentioned two uh, neutron sources, fission and yes. neutron sources. Uh, which one of those is the best in terms of flux? Because uh, usually neutron flux is quite low. Very, yes. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard to say um, because when you use the spallation source, you actually have a low flux, but you may... Okay, so uh, the spallation source is pulsed. And it, because it's pulsed, it means you often are able to measure more of the neutrons. So more of the neutrons are usable. Um, yeah, it's hard to say. They have different, they have, they're different. So I wouldn't say one is better than the other. So the answer is spallation source has less flux, but more of the neutrons are usable. And in the end, they have different properties, which makes it better for different things. Thanks. Um, so you mentioned two methods for doing the inelastic neutron scattering, yes. one with the scanning and the other using like time of flight. Yes. Uh, what are the advantages of both, or is there one clear winner? Like, there's, what would you again, choose? Again, there's not a clear winner. So um, if you use time of flight, you tend to be able to measure large regions of reciprocal space and energy simultaneously. So if you, so you can spend two days measuring everything, but not in great detail. Um, so you get an overview. And if you do the scanning, which you do on the triple axis spectrometer, you, what you can do there is you can measure half an hour, for example, but you can change temperature. So you can do parametric studies which you couldn't spend two days per temperature using time of flight. It wouldn't make sense. Thanks. Yeah, going back to this question from Niklas, in, in fact, if you, let's, let's take the Heisenberg uh, kind yes. of systems. But if you, oh, sorry. So if you want to see this two-magnon or um, multi-magnon, you basically you, I thought you scan the energy yes. and you go to higher energies you and then you can see them see at that, higher right? energy. If they are allowed, if they naturally come out exactly. of the Hamiltonian, you will see them yeah. Yeah. anyway. I think, I think it was a different point. So I maybe there was, was a this multi magnon, but I'm not sure. Yes. Anyway. Thank you. Thank you. So actually related to the same questions. Uh, so say I have a, sp a spin wave is kind of an approximation linear sure. the spin wave approximation. You just use some things to get the what's supposed to be the low energy spectrum of some Hamiltonian. But say I have now 
a sp like a, a spin wave bound states, right? So I, I re-diagonalize my Hamiltonian and my lowest energy excitations are not really linear spin waves, right? The neutron scapples to the, the, the spin. So would I see, like say my lowest excite, excitation is kind of a bound state of four, four spin waves that you cannot really describe in a good, good spin wave basis. Would I see that? I mean, you will see what the excitations are. Whether you can model them with spin waves or not is a different matter. But I don't, maybe I didn't understand. Right, the so question. I, if spin wave theory is imperfect. So I just just gave it as the first example. That's all. Mm -hmm. But did I understand your question? I don't know. Yes, you can oh, see magnon, magnon bound states. Okay, so there's one other thing. So there's a neutron scattering rule that the change in spin must be one or zero. So this limits what you can see. So if it has to obey this rule. Uh, so of course, if you can't see everything. But you see it on here. You could see, if it's, you can see a continuum if, you, if you've got multi-magnons. So as a general rule, so just generally, the excitations have to obey the neutron scattering cross-section rules, otherwise they're not observable. But multi-magnons often are. Well, it depends what we call multi-magnon, that's what I'm asking. <laughs> Mm -hmm. so. uh, what do you do if you have fractionalized excitations? What methods can you use then? Right, so you can see fractional excitations, it's just you can't see one of them. You can see two of them because together their spin is one. So you can create, that's why you create them in pairs. So you've got two spin ons, you can create a pair of spin ons. Okay. You can't create in just one. In a deconfined phase, uh, is there any way you could use neutron scattering? Uh, so if you have a deconfined phase of the yes. spinons, can we still use? Uh, yes. Okay. You could still see them. You just have to create two of them. And then another question. So when we do the spin wave uh, thing uh, with the Hausch and Primer transformation, we usually assume uh, that we have a uh, uh, low occupation of the magnons. Yes. Right, uh, but at low temperatures, what prevents uh, a boson shell condensation of the magnons? Or what? Yeah. Um, well, they're not all in the same. Yeah, I don't. I don't think they can all be in the same state. They're not true bosons. Um, you can get Bose-Einstein condensation. Um, but you have to use a magnetic field. So you have to use a magnetic field to push, like a spin one mode, into the ground state, and then all the bosons go into the ground state. Um, but you don't normally see it. Okay. Maybe someone else has an answer to this. Uh, um. So I think when you talk about magnon condensation, usually that it's you have some, you have lots of magnons, and eventually the magnon condensate is actually the ordered state. The magnon condensate state is actually the ordered state. Uh, and if you're at low yes. temperature, uh, these things are still excited states. I mean, the, bos the magnons are still excited states. It's not a, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, they the cost energy. The so ground state has long range magnetic order yes. still. Oh, yeah. And it's, uh, they're excited states. But mm. if you don't have long range magnetic order, in some cases, you can, tune the, well, you've got 
No long range, you've got a singlet ground state and then you've got an excitation. You can, uh, a spin, a gapped spin one excitation, you can use a magnetic field to push it, push that excitation band into the ground state and that can be equivalent to Bose-Einstein condensation. What's the description? Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah. And then, um, so this were work many years ago by, I think, um, Sebastian. She was doing that. But she was looking into a Bose Einstein condensation of this type of um, yes. single states. And, and then you could, you could basically map the phase transition. It was following um, the critical exponents that you would expect for a Bose Einstein condensation. And what I was talking about was the anti condensation of triplons, and she was doing neutron scattering data for that. I'm not sure whether are you talking about that? Because this is one context where one has been talking a lot about was the anti condensation of magnetic excitations. Wasn't exactly what I meant, just probability of the such a period yeah. of expansion. Okay, okay. Yeah. This this was one example of material where one was talking about was the anti condensation of magnetic excitations. I, I, I can bring an example tomorrow, actually. Exactly, you do have some example. Yes, I'm calling. Christian Frug. Yes, Christian Frug. No more questions? Let's thank Ben again.